Did it say it start recording? Yes, please. That would be super. And once I start my presentation, I'll need a feedback whether it's getting right or not. Yes. Okay. As in, if you can see the presentation. I can see the mountains at the moment. Yes, that did not go as expected. <laughs> How about see, now? Yes, I can see your introductory slide now. Yes, that is perfect. Thank you. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Yulia, and I'm a developer advocate for Vonage, where I focus on low-code tools and technologies, uh, different approaches to enable uh, our audiences to use our APIs and products. So today, I wanted to introduce you to low code using the tool that first introduced myself um, to low code, and that is Node-RED. First, uh, let's see what the low code, no code thing is about um, and how it all started. There's a lot of terms going on, as you could hear um, earlier in the beginning uh, conversation. To clear things up, I tend to say no good for every software tool platform where the user does not interact with code and anywhere where it gets to a more technical angle, like you're using curly brackets, maybe mustache templating, or even writing uh, code, mostly JavaScript into it, that is low code uh, in my view. So what's the current state of logo? <laughs> Funny thing, I first started um, researching and looking into low code solutions about two years ago. And then I did a couple of Google searches looking through all the terms, low code, no code, flow-based programming, uh, visual programming, everything I could think of um, around this topic. And honestly, not a lot of things came up in the Google search. I repeated that um, last year and the last year. And only for low code, I had 4 million results. And again, I did that this morning. Uh, this is a screenshot from this morning. And that is 3.7 billion results on the term low code. So it's definitely gaining traction. Um, I believe under the current climate, a lot of businesses had to go online and low code or no code uh, was really a lifesaver for many of them because they did not have the resources for development team, but taking their services online with just a little bit of help from a low code tool uh, was a good solution. I also came across uh, this image from Mario Noyoso. He tried to collect all the local tools uh, he could find. And that's a lot of them. Uh, when I first looked at it, I realized at least 80% of those are something that I haven't interacted with. But if you have a closer look, I'm sure you will find uh, names that you wouldn't have thought are low code or do low code but you might have seen before. So how did we end up here? It all started a while back. So different visual or flow-based approaches started coming in from the 1960s. Um, and they looked a lot like this, different directions, different approaches. Some of them uh, were more of a hardware oriented thing, other uh, approaches were to teach kids how to learn about code. And some ended up like this. <laughs> so this is the case where we are applying an abstraction, a visual abstraction to the code in the idea to make it more easily comprehensible, easier to interact with it, and enabling people who might find code a little hard to grasp or time consuming, 
to get their tasks done in a better, faster, easier way. Now, when you take away the complexity of code, but add in the visual complexity, I don't think that is um, that useful at the end of the day. And in my opinion, this might have been um, one of the reasons why visual coding hasn't really gained that much of attraction, um, even though there have been quite a lot of attempts in the past. Um, a couple more uh, images from the past. Uh, this is actually a really um, cool one if you want to teach your kids how to uh, start writing code. I believe it's Scratch, yes. So from those, uh, we've come a long way. And nowadays, low-code platforms look a lot more like this. <laughs> so this is up here, IFTTT. Both of these on the no-code end of the spectrum, really clear, uh, intuitive, user-friendly. A little more limited, but for basic tasks like generating an invoice, sending a notification. If you are a small business that is not an API company, but needs some solutions um, around business operations, then these two uh, tools are really great. And so is the next one, uh, which is Airtable. This is taking a spreadsheet and making it smart. So I think Airtable did a really good job in here. They took, honestly, what was Google Sheets and built so much on top of it that it's a whole low-code platform at, at this moment. And then we have um, Node-RED as we're going down the complexity line. Still pretty clear visually. It gets a little more complex, not as intuitive or user-friendly as uh, the previous ones, also not as limited. And I would even say that uh, Postman could be a low-code thing. So it's not that visual, it's no longer drag and drop and connecting together with wires. And yes, I personally might write um, 50 lines of pre-request script and 100 lines in test. Now, honestly, the test is shorter always. That might just be me. Uh, but the end user, then comes into the collection, fills in environment variables and presses send. So from their end, uh, there wasn't really interaction with code. And I do believe that low code is for everyone in the sense that there is a tool out there for everyone, not that low code in general is a good fit for everyone. So the way code, is good for every developer. I'm not saying JavaScript is for everyone. And you can uh, pick and choose your tools uh, to find the right one for you. And yes, developers are people too. So if there is a tool out there for everyone, that means there is something for us as well. Uh, and I'll stop rambling right now. So uh, let's get into Node-RED and let me show you how I got into low code and how this tool helped me do that. <coughs> so hopefully you're seeing Node-RED right now. Um, Node-RED.org, this is their website. It is an open source. Um, low-code tool or platform, uh, low-code programming for event-driven applications. Uh, I always like to come uh, to their website and check out what they are calling themselves. It's usually a good starting point. So um, if you go to the documentation and find the getting started section, you can see that there's a lot of ways in which uh, you could run Node-RED. Today, we are going to run it locally. And all I need to do for that to happen is to install it uh, using npm, which I have already done, and then come into my terminal 
and type Nildred. So Nildred is an LGS application. It has a runtime and an editor. And when I run it, it will give me a URL uh, that's port 1880. And if I open this in a browser, that is where my editor um, can be found. So this is how uh, the Nudra editor looks like when you first open it up. I already have it, uh, something in here, but you would normally only have one flow. This main area, this white blank space is your workspace. This is where you're going to build your workflows. Um, the tabs, these would be your applications. Um, they are also called flows. So that's flow two that we are currently on and will be building. I also have another one uh, next to it, flow one. This is a different application. I have it disabled, so this will not bother us for now. On the left-hand side, you have your node palette. So nodes are these building blocks, if you will. Well, they are black box processes more. And you will drag and drop these into your workspace and connect them together with a wire uh, to define how the data interacts in between them. The data that goes in between them is always a JSON file and we'll see how that goes. Nodred also is an event-driven environment. So you build your applications and then you need some things to set it off. So in testing environments, I like to use the inject button. Um, it is a node with a button. Once I save uh, this flow, that button becomes clickable. So when I click it, it will start my application. In a real world scenario, this might be an incoming webhook or something else happening in my workflow. And it will start off um, my application with a certain value. And that is by default the timestamp. So um, it will send uh, the value of message that payload being the timestamp down um, towards the other node. So why message? In Nodred, there are three contexts uh, we talk about. There's the message object that is uh, in the data in between everything that is connected together with a wire. There is a flow object, flow context, that is everything on the same tab. And there is global, which goes across flows, across tabs. So the main uh, information that is going from the first node to the second one is the message object. We are attaching to it. Message that payload will always be in there and that is the main information that's going down. And we are setting um, that value to start um, our application with. Let's change it from timestamp to, let's do a hello world, <laughs> never gets old. So I can, This always happens to me. Um, command tab. <laughs> no, control tab. Toggles the sidebar. Um, and you also use it when looking for emojis. Um, message the topic comes from uh, the MQTT background of Node-RED. I don't tend to use it. Um, so we can just leave it blank. And we click done. That is to save. In Node-RED as a rule of thumb, if a button is red, you press it. That's how you save. That's how you deploy. So that is going to start off my flow uh, with the text, hello world. Next, I have a 
debug node. So this will output uh, the value of message that payload into the debug area, which is, I think, console would be the equivalent. So I can hit now deploy. I confirm deploy. And if I open up the debug area and press the button, it will output the value of message the payload. I could have also chosen to um, output the complete message object, uh, which then shows us the structure of this object. So it has an ID and currently um, the payload property is attached to it. Um, topic is empty. These two come by default, but you can also choose to attach uh, different um, properties to the message object and they would appear in here. Right. So if you don't really know what these nodes are for, um, I have a quite a default setup in here. So when you first install node red, uh, a lot of these nodes will come in, the common, the function ones, um, network. So what you would most commonly use. If you don't know what they do, one, you can hover over them. And there is this little book symbol that opens up your node help. So in the right hand side, uh, you will find a mini documentation like section, which will explain what that certain node does, um, how many inputs, outputs it has, uh, what these would be, and how it would interact. Uh, the inject node actually has a history section, most nodes don't, but someone thought this would be interesting. So it explains um, the concept of timestamp. Right, so if you install Node-RED and you find that something that you would like to build cannot be achieved with these nodes, there's a way to install more. And then you can come over to the Manage Palettes section. Under Nodes, you can find everything that you already have installed. Uh, these are the packages, node modules, or install and start typing and everything related to that uh, will come up. There's a different way of looking for this, and that is by coming back to uh, nodered.org and going to flows. So this is your node library. Uh, there are more than 3000 nodes, and those are usually packages. Uh, there might be more nodes in a package. Uh, you can browse from here, or you can have a look at uh, flows. These are complete applications. Maybe someone has already built the solution that you're looking for. And collections uh, might be a combination of the two or collection of nodes. You can also uh, import or export these flows. So Nudra does come uh, with GitHub integration, but if you would like to share a certain bit uh, that you've built, a full flow, or uh, maybe I just want to share this bit uh, with someone, then I can select that hamburger menu and export. Now, most things in your editor are defined by JSON. So we'll click the formatted version to see a little bit more about what is in here. There is an array of J, um, JSON objects that define the nodes that I have in there and uh, the relationship in between them. And I can take this JSON file and take it across machines, um, load it back into Node-RED and run it. Now, this is a really simple example, um, but the important bit is that it's easily taken from one part to the other. Uh, and usually at the beginning, I was getting uh, questions around version control and sharing and collaborating. Um, 
that is solved um, either this way or a GitHub integration. So if you do just look at what goes into one node, uh, it has an ID type inject because that is um, the node we're looking at. It will have an, uh, we did not name it. You can come up with a custom name. Um, the properties, and we didn't really set up anything sp special about it except payload, which is uh, the text we provided and then a couple other details of uh, where it is in the flow and the wire that is attached to it. Now, if we look at the other node, it will have the same wire attached to it. So this is the debug. Hmm. It does not. I apologize. So the wires are the ones going out and the one going, coming in. And I could, in a similar way, import a flow. So if I paste the same JSON and click import, and it picks up on the fact that it's a duplicate um, and I have options. Yes, I do want to import it and then I can place it into my workspace. Okay, so uh, that was a really simple uh, example, but uh, let's see something a little bit more real world and where I'm getting with this. Um, I'm going to show you something with our APIs because uh, that's the package I've been working on. So I can show you the code and uh, see how you build the node and how you would extend it. So um, we are one inch previously Nexmo. Our node ready instance is still Nexmo. Um, so bear with me. When I pull the code up, uh, one inch and Nexmo as words can be uh, used interchangeably. And let's pick a simple use case like sending an SMS so that we can uh, clearly see um, how that node is built. So uh, I can add this node in between the inject and the debug if it picks up on it. If not, then I can just connect it again and double click on it uh, to edit the fields. So first credentials. This is a thing I like about Node-RED um, that you can provide your credentials in here. Click on add and it saves it as a configuration node. So if you come over to the configuration nodes area, then um, it has saved as type next no basic odd um, the combination of my um, API can password. Now I was hoping to have my real key and password in there. Um, I'll quickly go and grab them from my bondage account. That's what mock accounts are for. So I'll end up editing this one. And so normally when presenting, I would use this feature to not show API can secret, but it will save it um, and attribute an ID to it. So next time I would need to authenticate with the same kind of auth, um, I wouldn't need to provide API key and secret. I can just uh, use the config node. Well, it will pick up automatically on the config node. And then I have a couple of fields. These are specific to sending an SMS. So I need a destination number. Sender. Um, we're in the, well, I'm in the UK, you're possibly in Singapore, both countries allow for alphanumeric sender ID. So if this was 
my company selling different products and I would uh, like to send an SMS not- notification to a customer. I could put my brand name in there um, so that they know it's coming from me. And text. So you notice these curly brackets uh, next to the to, from, and text fields. That means it's uh, it supports mustache templating. So now I have the send SMS node after the inject node. That means I can dynamically pull in properties and values uh, that are either before this node or of a global or flow level context. So I started off the flow uh, with message that payload value of hello world. Uh, if I wanted to send it as a text in the SMS, I can uh, use mustache templating to reference message that payload. And that would be the outcome. Since I have an emoji in there, I will check in the code. And done to save it and deploy. It keeps complaining about an ngrok node uh, because it recommends on the other flow. Actually, let me delete this flow. Um, I didn't have authentication provided for that one. So every time uh, I deploy it, it complains. Okay, so back to the debug area. Now, if I press the button, it will send me an SMS. And in the debug area, I will get the response object. So I'm not sure how good that on camera is, but I have an SMS in there. And in here, um, the response object, which is uh, quite typical to our API. So um, this was the expected outcome of a successful request. Now let's see what goes into creating a node like this. I'll leave this open like that. So back to documentation, um, I find myself coming here quite often. And the creating nodes guide is actually a really good one. Uh, so you can just go to create your first node and uh, you will need a package JSON, a JavaScript and an HTML file uh, to build one node. So you could use the same JavaScript and HTML file for more nodes, but one certain node needs to have one JS file and one HTML. Uh, let's see how that goes. Actually, I have my file system opened up in here. Hopefully you can see enough of that. So I went into the folder where Nudred got installed and if you go on into node modules and there you can find all the packages uh, that you've installed and the default ones. So that would be node contrib nextmo in my case. And in there under nodes, I will find combination of HTML and JavaScript files for every node um, that we have in our package. So for example, the SMS one, I have an SMS HTML and an SMS JavaScript. I also have the package that JSON, which lists everything uh, that I have in there. And that is the bit that you would need to add in if you were creating the SMS node right now. So, First, let's see the HTML file because that defines how the node editor and the documentation looks like. So SMS REST HTML. 
first I am uh, defining these, which correspond to credentials to from Next and Unicode check box from the uh, node editor. Then a uh, couple other details like number of inputs and outputs, um, the icon label, and once I, uh, yes, label is uh, when it's already in your workspace, but that label is when it's still in the node palette. Let's change that. And then as I come down here, um, this is uh, the form for collecting uh, those values. So the first one is for credentials, um, then to, from, text, um, and the checkbox for Unicode. And that's all for the uh, node editor. And down here is how I would define uh, the documentation that appears in the sidebar. So if I come back here, uh, click on node help, this bit on the right hand side um, is what is defined here in the HTML file. And then onto the functionality, which comes from the JavaScript file. So for us to understand this, let's compare with uh, the Vonage code snippets that we offer as an SDK and uh, the template that Node provides. And uh, then we can see how we arrived to this bit of code. So if I come to our developer platform and go to code snippets and find the one that is, yes, sending an SMS with Unicode, and yes, Node.js is already selected. To be fair, I, I have quite an easy job developing for Node.red as we already have the code snippets for Node.js. And since Node.red is Node, well, built on Node.js, so there's not really a lot of things to um, adjust. And on the other hand, um, we are back to our creating your first node guide, which if you scroll down, it will give you um, examples of each of these three files. So this is their JavaScript um, file example. This is for a um, simple converting to lowercase uh, function. So we take this, and on the other end, uh, sending SMS with Vonage that we've looked at, and then we achieve um, this JavaScript file. So first of all, I'm getting the data. I am running it through, well, rendering through master's templating, because those three fields that we've looked at before, these three, uh, since they support master's templating, something might come through that needs to be rendered. Then I'm instantiating the next mode that is Vonage, um, API, API secret, that is my checkbox for Unicode. And then I am sending um, the SMS. And at the end, I am loading the response back into message that payload and returning uh, the message object. And this bit at the end is um, getting all additional data that um, usually appears in every uh, situation in Node. So the custom bit is this. And at the end of the day, I'm not even sure if I would um, 
say it's another framework. But me adopting adapting our SDKs to Neodred is minimal work. And I think it does help um, the end user a lot. So uh, I do like doing that. So coming back. Yes. So at the core of it, Nodred is just JavaScript rubbed into a visual editor, really. Um, it does not come with the limitations of the no code platforms. It really can do anything that Node can do. Does that mean that it has to be used instead of Node.js? No, not always, probably most often not. So uh, let's see when to consider low code. I quite like it for prototyping because I definitely drag and drop faster than I type. So it's also a nice thinking tool once you're familiar with the product, especially. Um, our customer support uh, really likes these to recreate different issues uh, customers might have. I, for myself, when uh, thinking about building a certain use case, a certain solution, I like playing around with Node-RED because at the end of it, I have a minimum viable product that I can actually use and run and demo as opposed to a theoretical something um, or something mocked up. So I do have a little bit of advantage in there that I have something working as opposed to a theory of we'll build it in two weeks. I also quite enjoy using it for low value or low complexity things. Um, well, for things that are nice to have, for example, um, pulling in tweets that mention our theme into Slack so that we don't miss them. Is this essential? No. Is there a business value? Questionable. But it's a nice to have uh, using low code for it is literally one or two minutes. I'm not wasting my time. I can focus on my um, real value as a developer. And on the other end, um, what I mentioned at the beginning for things like business operations, um, generating invoices, sending emails, notifications, uh, putting data from a form into a spreadsheet. These would be the repetitive, low complexity things. Um, that are quite valuable once automated because it saves a lot of time. So I think that would be one of the contributors for why low code got so popular lately, because uh, those are the things uh, that people are doing more and more these days. And another thing is maintainability. So it's both a pro and a con here. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily build your revenue generating product, especially if you're an API company um, with low code. So you could argue that it's not something maintainable, it's more of a hobby use case, which I won't agree against. But there are certain use cases where maybe it's a small team, it's a mom and pop shop, um, they need a little bit of automation or a little bit of help. Maybe you're the only developer on the team. And it's important to build something that outlasts you. Also, it's quite empathetic <laughs> and handover friendly uh, to build something that the rest of the team can interact with. For example, I had someone tell me that they built the whole business operations bit on Zapier, even though they were hired as a developer. Because after assessing the situation and uh, what they had to deal with, they realized they were the only technical person on the team. So they could have written the code. Sorry, they were also a con contractor. So comes in, writes the code, leaves. There's no one to maintain the code. So uh, he reached the conclusion that the best solution would be to do low code, 
bordering no code because Zapier is on the more limited side of things. Even if it wasn't the best, most elegant solution for that certain case, that was the best solution because then they could go away and the team that um, they helped could maintain um, what they've built as a solution. And you aren't really a production developer 24 seven. So from time to time, you might find yourself in one of these um, situations. Maybe you're working on a personal project and it's just a quicker way or uh, you're teaching kids about code, about building applications, um, playing around with hardware or um, yeah, just building things with uh, non-developers or finding the common denominator to build something together. Now, what low-code probably is not for, low-code is not here to replace code engineering teams. It's not a, let's stop writing code, let's use this cool thing that does everything for us. No, it's not. Um, it's not a way to save money on development re resource. I mentioned at the beginning that during the pandemic, a lot of people benefited from low-code solutions because they either didn't have development resource available or they couldn't afford it. Well, that doesn't mean that it's a long-term scalable solution in every use case. It might be a nice automation to send out an email notification, but it's definitely not something that long-term replaces engineering themes. Also, it's nearly always a platform. So you will have to weigh up the risks of that. Uh, building your product on top of a platform always comes with its risks. And so it is on top of every programming language tool or platform. So that's something you need to be aware of uh, and make a decision for yourself. Well, sorry. And at the end of it, I think it comes down to the efficiency of writing code. So low code isn't here to replace code or to replace developers. It is here to alleviate us. So it might come in handy for us to get certain things out of the way, to get quickly through something and then focus our efforts on what really matters on the high value tasks that really do require our efforts. And at the end of the day, it's finding the right tool for the right problem and creating the right solution with it. And who knows, from time to time, that might even be low code. I'll be wrapping up in a bit. So if you have questions, you might want to start typing those now. If you want to find out more about low code, I'm doing um, a stream on Twitch. I do realize that is quite late for you. Uh, that's every Wednesday at 3 p.m. UK time. They are on YouTube, so you can catch up with them. And if you're interested in signing up for a Vonage account and uh, seeing what we've built in Nodred or with any other uh, technologies, uh, you can do that and use a coupon code for 10 euros. Otherwise, I will leave the resources up for you. Um, you can find more about Nodred, um, about Locode Hour and content tutorials, how to get started with Nodred. And I thank you. Thanks very much, Julia. Does anybody have any questions? I 
have a question about uh, composition. I was wondering if you'd created a flow that did something, uh, maybe something quite complex, and then you wanted to reuse it. Could you cal could you uh, put that flow, wrap that flow up into a node, and then reuse that node in other places? Yes. So I believe these are called subflows. I will be honest. I haven't used Node in a while because I've been focusing on something else for the past couple of months. But uh, there are subflows. tend to lag behind the documentation. Uh, but there is definitely a way to um, build a flow and um, group it into what is called a subflow. So visually, it will appear as um, one building block, although you can open it up and then you have the full workflow that you've built. You can also define um, input and output for it. So the whole thing um, will behave like a node. Does okay. that answer yes, the that, question? Yes, I think that would be useful. Um, OK, does it do type checking? Uh, you made a string, and then you passed a string. What if you had accidentally passed a number or passed an object? Would node red um, catch that and say you're trying to put a number in where a string is expected? Does it do that sort of thing? It would take the number as a string. OK, it would coerce it. OK. Uh, and if I had a JavaScript application and I wanted to um, execute a flow that maybe somebody, um, uh, one of the non-coders in my company had written, how would, could I, could I could I call their flow from my application? Would I have to do it by API, or are there other ways to do that? So have someone use Node Red and you yourself not using Node Red? Uh, yeah, I, I think I guess the idea is well, we've got a, a big team, and some people are developers, and then some people are making flows to do a part of the application, and I want to execute their flows. I get the result back in my in my JavaScript application. I would possibly go with web webhooks. Okay, okay, yeah. So they okay. We we host it on an API and then call call to the API. Okay, makes sense. Oh yeah. Uh, can, can you make Node Red output an image? Because I quite like graphics. I was wondering if you could uh, make a flow and the, the end result is an image, or even an animated yes. image would be very interesting. So I didn't touch on this, but there is a whole package that I do not have installed um, for dashboard UI. So Node Red does have a visual uh, side to it. And people have been working on it. Um, something I didn't say, uh, if it's Node Red dashboard, that means it's a default Node Red approved uh, package. If it's Node Red contrib, um, everyone can contribute to it. So um, always make sure you click through and see uh, what you're installing. Uh, but I do know this one. And I'm not sure if I have to restart the whole thing or just the editor. And there they are. So um, I'll quickly just put a couple of those in there without making much sense. 
you also have a template so uh, you can write the HTML and output things in there right. and uh, grab values from um, the backend. Might fail. <laughs> but what I want to show you is that I can grab that URL. So that's the local host 1880. And put a UI after it. And welcome to the node red dashboard. Yes, it does ask me to add nodes that are properly configured. So. Okay, so you could make the whole front end for your flow in in the flow, and then somebody can access it just through that page. Yes. So I could send an SMS so, from your from your web page. Yes, you could. Um, I just realized I have a blog post that has images in there. It helps if I can type. We have a new learning platform. And Working progress. So it is a really simple UI, but I built this um, in order using the dashboard buttons. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a um, provide an it's a two FA, well mocking a two FA solution. Um, for the purpose of a um, tutorial. And if we want to see how that was built, um, oh, is this the whole flow? Yes, that's the whole flow. So if I take that, And import it. It doesn't like something. Back to the dashboard. Yes. I don't see any it is, connections in that flow. That is because the functionality is not in there. So okay. all I imported um, was the nodes that build. Okay. So what I would do in here, um, I would connect to these, the rest of the functionality. Right. I believe I should have that as well. Not in forum, but in flows. That's okay. I believe you. Yeah. Um, I, I have another question. So, people are using your APIs at, at the moment, or they're uh, they're using yeah they're using your nodes. Um, what are the, what are the most common things people use your things for? usually notifications. So, well, the APIs themselves, uh, that will, that's for all type of um, communication related things, phone calls, uh, video calls, um, SMS messaging, okay. um, sort of would, 2FA. So how would they get the input into those, to trigger those, how would they get the input in? 
how they get the input of so um they 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 want to use a node to trigger a notification where would the data come from usually um usually webhooks right so okay. <laughs> setting up a webhook um right it's an um, http in http response and i like to add the debug as well and you set it up uh, method and url and okay you're done this uh, what you're doing here is quite um could be quite valuable to our listeners because we're making apis all the time and um it might be nice if we could make a few without having to code. Uh, maybe, maybe people like to code. Uh, I think it's to each their own, uh, but I do like it. And I found myself building things for a client that was already using Node-RED. We haven't released something yet and then until the release came out, I put together something in the address from different nodes so that they could use it. Oh, and that's on video as well. <laughs> Oops. So it's really fast for trying out different things and really just for, I like it as a tr thinking tool. At the end of the day, you might go away and write the code. But it's quite powerful. Mm. I like it. Mm. I had one other thought, uh, which was you when you in next mode, you had to type the template message dot payload, and um, it was a mustache template. Yes. Uh, okay, and there was no completion on that. Unfortunately, I was hoping that would be something you could. Drag and drag and drop. Say, I want the the message to go into this field, but maybe it maybe when there's a template involved, it's a bit more complicated because you might have other you might have the completion as in uh, have it auto complete or yeah have it yeah just auto complete or maybe just um because you type you had to type this in by hand didn't you and um, yes it might be nice for the for the non-developers if they could just sort of drag this in there or have it maybe offered to them. So you type message dot and then it, or maybe it I do that. think that would be valuable. Um, a lot of other local tools that are a little more abstract like Zapier do that. So um, you could either select from a drop down list all the values that are available to you or when you start typing. But I haven't noticed that in Node-RED yet. And then I suppose when you're not using a mustache template, then it would just be the input and that would be done, that would be done automatically, I guess. So that would be an easy way, but it's just because of the template here, it's a bit more. A bit more oh yeah. so. An easy way would have been to just write the text in here and that would have worked. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to showcase because mm -hmm. this is not a common use case. Um, we would have the text to be something that, um, well, a string provided, but what we would do is uh, template the two and start of the flow uh, with an array of numbers and then it would send to each number the same message or maybe template the message. Um, right. But if we right. want to template the message, that would require a couple of extra steps in between. Um, okay. What I've That's... used it, I think, for emails as well. Um, mm -hmm. Nice to grab a couple of details and then use a template node and put together strings with um, holding values.
Okay, thank you very much, Julia, for your introduction to Node Red. Um, anybody else have questions? See, there is something in the chat. Oh, yeah. So team workflows, as far as I'm concerned, there is no way to log into a team workspace. So at one given time, there would be one person working it. You can use hosted versions and then have two people log in there, but that usually results in a mess. Yes, there is a project feature. So if you come to the... Um, folder where Nodres is installed, you will find a settings.js file. Um, there's a lot of things commented out in here. Um, it's worth having a read and seeing which features you want enabled and which not. I mostly use this um, instance for uh, doing things from scratch, so I have most things disabled. And if you come right to the bottom, you might have it in there, you might not have it in there, uh, but this is the bit you want to add. Excuse me. So editor team and projects, uh, setting enabled to true. And I save it. Um, I think I should restart it and now. I might actually need to reinstall. Okay, yes. So now I have projects uh, enabled and that is a um, Git repository. But it's just as you would use GitHub from your computer, it's not a collaboration as an at the same time collaborating on something. And I'm not sure which account I'm signing to get to yeah. I don't think I can do this for now. Because we have our Git account uh secured. Mm -hmm. And that's a multi step thing. Uh, someone has uh, asked, could you share your tw Twitch stream? Yes. Uh, so that's, yes. Let me just quickly see. There is um, a lot. Of... So that is the URL, but it's um, team level thing. So um, a lot of my colleagues also do streams in there. Um, you can go through the schedule and see what's going on. And we also have a YouTube channel. So um, for that, I'm going to quickly take this off screen. Oh, no. That is the YouTube channel uh, where you can kind of get a feel for uh, what we do. 
We have a question here from John. Uh, what is your experience with non-developers setting up no, no de Node-RED? Uh, he's found that non-developers uh, could not wrap their head around the setup process. So how has that worked with the groups you've been working with? I tend to not recommend Node-RED for complete non-technical audiences. I think there are better suited tools out there um, that someone would be better off starting with, like Zapier. I found that Zapier is uh, one that people wrap their minds around quite easily. And once you've interacted with a couple of them, then you get the understanding of what a variable is, um, templating, pulling certain values in, how APIs interact with each other, how data flows, how different steps come together. And once you have that understanding, then I would start off someone with uh, Node-RED. While it allows you to do so much more, I think you do need a certain level of technical knowledge for Node-RED. It's not about knowing how to code, it's about the concepts of variables of an API of uh, webhooks. So it's not as beginner friendly as um, other no-code or low-code tools might be. I have not seen an exhaustive list of concepts. Um, Let me see what's in. Uh, the editor. There are courses out there on Node-RED, honestly. I haven't taken or looked at any of them, but I would assume those might explain a couple of things. Also, what you would get in a beginner JavaScript course um, or programming 101, I, I would say those would be And also looking at the common nodes, the function, and uh, understanding how these webhooks work. I don't have an answer right now, um, but if you send me a message on Twitter, maybe, um, or even Telegram, because I mean, the uh, group and you can find me. Then I'll try to come up with a more comprehensive uh, answer to that question, but I haven't really thought to a list of you have to have these concepts before. I just tend to go to the easier to use tool first and if that gets the job done then, then good because uh, it's faster, easier and they feel better about themselves as opposed to trying to drop someone in the deep end and scare them with this thing that is supposed to be low code and it's supposed to be easy, but it's not as easy as expected. Um, actually, I've got people who were deterred by... When I first started doing Node-RED, I had people get interested, oh, that's low code, so maybe there's hope for me, I can write code, but I would like to understand better the APIs our company does. And then when they saw the things I was using Node-RED for, they kind of got scared of it and never touched low code again. Even though in the meantime, uh, we've uh, discovered different tools uh, that were friendlier and better suited for beginners. So I tend to see each individual case and 
for beginners, start them off with Zapier or <laughs> Zapier is a good compromise because it's limited, but not way too limited. There's a lot of things you can still um, achieve with it. And it's also like you log in and it connect this app with this one. So you select an app that you want to start building with. Um, I don't know. Also, there are recommended workflows. So as you open it up, already have information on how to get started, where to get started, and the concepts of, oh, you have to connect applications. So you select, look for one, maybe Gmail. Oh, look, there it is. And if I receive an email, maybe I want to save something from there into a, an Airtable base. Okay, so it's it's connected. Oh, what happens? So when when I get a new attachment, then I want to create a record. For example, save that attachment uh, into my Airtable base, and then try it. I do realize that was a quite a less intelligent example that I came up in there. And then it guides you through step by step. It's really intuitive and really helpful as opposed to Node-RED, which all the really helpful and speeds things up, especially for a developer. You kind of need to have those habits that you would have while writing code. So, okay, I want to do something. How do I do that? I go research it. I read documentation, look at APIs. How does the API behave? Which more often than not, I find is way too overwhelming for someone just starting out. So maybe try starting them off with something a little friendlier and then they can move on to something else if they cannot achieve um, what they wanted with the first tool. I hope that's somewhat helpful. That does look um, that does look much easier to use because uh, it looks like you cannot plug anything together that won't work. Uh, whereas with coding and I think with Node Red, you could plug things together that then might not belong together. Yes. Um, someone John says uh, that it would be good to take a small set of core nodes. That's actually something we were working on. I'm not sure I have it installed on this computer. It doesn't come with Node Red. Um, but my colleague Sam and I uh, played around last year with uh, wrapping Node-RED into an Electron app and um, providing our custom set of nodes uh, for customers and then having um, a stripped down version um, even for our nodes as opposed to having um, all these, which mm -hmm. even our palette gets a little confusing for someone who is not well, not familiar with the API, because I know exactly that each one of those uh, corresponds to a certain endpoint that I am aware of how it behaves and what to expect of it. But someone seeing this for the first time, I'm pretty sure <laughs> it doesn't say a lot. Um, so we would like to take even these and, uh, well, not would like, it's already happening. Um, and do the nodes as um, your first question, um, more of them building a use case and having a use case focused um, subflow, well, not subflow because we saved it as a node, but it's a more comprehensive node that does uh, more things, hence taking some of the complexity away and making it more abstract. So someone who is even less technical um, could approach that. And then we would take out most of these 
um, nodes that you see in the default palette and only leave in there uh, what they would need at first. Uh, let me see if I have it installed. Oh, what are we says, calling it? I think interested to see your dumbed down version. We are thinking to do the same for apps in his construction vertical. All right. Um, let me see if I can remember my password. Yes. So this is not the latest option because the latest version um, has the low level things, but um, it is an Electron application and uh, it does have things in there. This was at the stage where um, we were looking at the developer option because we also thought about um, somehow building in a switch. Because I'm not sure you can see it. It looks like Nodred, but it's a little bit more. It's wrapped with Angrock um, so that it automatically um, exposes it to the internet so that someone doesn't have to bother with uh, that. And then... Uh, I can just anchor up and select connect and it will um, automatically expose it to the internet. So uh, the same way that works, uh, we want to put in a switch so that we can differentiate between enterprise and developer customers. And then the switch would go um, so that it's only the high level things. And this would be the option for the uh, developer version. Making those yes, making those changes is only possible because Node Red is open source. Do you know if yes. Zapier is open source in the same way? Um, not in the same way, because Node Red is under uh, the OpenJS Foundation. You can create nodes for, uh, well, events. I think it's called events in Zapier, uh, the equivalent of nodes. Um, but I believe it has to be approved. OK. So we have. Um, you couldn't just clone also, this whole interface and, and tweak it how you wanted it. No. So. And even the um, nodes that, well, I keep saying nodes, I'm, I'm logged in um, nodes right now. Uh, but even the building blocks that are called. Uh, so it's triggers and actions. I think the collective thing, collective thing you call them is events. But even these are more use case oriented, a little more limited and definitely fewer uh, than you could see in Nodred. So we have um, four triggers and four actions depending on whether it's an incoming call or outgoing for um, the voice API, as opposed to if you go back to the Nodred editor, everything that is green is voice API. So, These are the aspects where you can see that Zapier is more limited, although quite capable. Mm -hmm. I think John's asking if Ngrok is open source, but I don't think it is. Um, it's a paid service for um, custom URLs, but there is a free package. One is running in Electron. Yes. So 
as in building it in, yes. Mm. We have it. I'm not even sure if we have the workbench thing. Uh, that's the Electron app. Um, accessible for the public. It might be private at this point because uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, I'll be honest, that's, that's the part my colleague did. So I am not entirely sure how that was wrapped, but I should have the code that um, wraps it. I've heard of other people putting Node-RED in Electron before, and uh, when I Google for it, there's quite a lot of uh, results. So the, you could probably just grab a tutorial or if you wanted to do it yourself, probably not too difficult. Oh, yes. oh definitely, that's what we did. Um, at that point, I think there was only one that um, completely rubbed it in a way that um, allow it for customization and extending it. And we forked that repository um, and then started adding in the bits like um, sign in Angrock um, and then the custom nodes. So it's very much still a work in progress and um, it's something that I plan on working on this year. And let me see if it is indeed private. If not, I'll leave the link in there. something except we've been going back and forth a lot and I am not sure this is the latest version. I'll leave it in there uh, as a this is how it started and then you have my uh, GitHub as well. And if I find it later, then um, I'll make it public. John says, thank you. Shall we thank wrap you. up now? Julia, thanks so much for sharing with us. Good luck. Um, well, thank you so much. Good luck.